Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hanega High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be taking a look at uh, two sections within Chapter 9 dealing with molecular shape polarity, and then we introduce valence bond theory, which gets into how molecules bond. I mean, we look at uh, orbitals within atoms in previous chapters. In this chapter, we're going to look at you know how those orbitals change when we form molecular sharings. Now, in Chapter 8, we discussed bond uh, dipoles, so polarity within bonds. Just because a molecule uh, possesses polar bonds does not mean that the molecule as a whole will be polar. And you may remember this from pre-AP chemistry. By looking at bond polarity and the symmetry of the molecule, both are important, we can determine if a molecule is polar. So in the case of our water molecule here, yes, the hydrogen to oxygen bond is definitely very polar. So this part of the bond becomes negative. Well, the same thing happens over here, so this part of the bond becomes very negative. So what happens as a whole is the top half of the molecule becomes very negative. And that's what we see here. So remember, in our color pictures, uh, the red is our electron-rich area, and the blue would be our electron deficit area. So in the case of a water molecule, we definitely ended up with a molecule overall that had poles, positive and negative regions. Well, not everything will do that because of symmetry. So if you remember, and this is an idea we discussed in pre-AP chemistry, bond type is nonpolar covalent. Well, it doesn't really matter what the symmetry is. So yes or no, it doesn't really matter about the symmetry. You automatically have a nonpolar molecule. If your bonds aren't polar, your molecule won't be polar. The polarity of a molecule have to start, has to start with the polarity of the bonds. But if you have a polar covalent bond type, even if you have a polar covalent bond, polar covalent bond type, if you have perfect symmetry, your dipoles will cancel and you still get a nonpolar molecule. Whereas in a polar covalent with no perfect symmetry, you do get, and this is what we saw with water, you do get a polar molecule. So you have to evaluate both bond type and the symmetry. And when you're looking at polarities as a whole, remember we don't typically look at simple two atom molecules and worry about shape and everything else. Well, when you have a two atom molecule, the polarity of the bond is the polarity of the molecule. So if we have polar bonds in HCl, it's going to be a polar molecule. But in other types of situations, you really have to evaluate both the shape and the bond type. So for instance, in CCl4 here in the middle, we have polarities within the bonds, but because of the perfect symmetry of that tetrahedral arrangement, overall the molecule ends up nonpolar. Whereas if we had, like we do here, CH3Cl, we don't really have that perfect symmetry canceling because we have a net movement in that direction, but we don't have dipoles opposed to that to cancel it out. So CH3Cl is a polar molecule. So you really have to look at both situations. Now, one of the consequences is of a molecule being polar or nonpolar is how it interacts with itself and other molecules around it. So how it interacts with itself, we're typically looking at what's called intermolecular force. It's a force of attraction between molecules. Now, there are fundamentally three different types of intermolecular forces between molecules. Now, if you have a polar molecule, the polarity of one molecule is a dipole a neighboring molecule that also has a dipole, you're going to get a dipole-dipole interaction. So the polarities of the two molecules will interact with each other, and you'll end up with a force of attraction between. So the positive will attract the negative, the negative will attract the positive, and you end up with molecules sticking together. So an intermolecular force of dipole-dipole is really what we get with polar molecules. Now, there's a special type of very strong dipole-dipole interaction that we call hydrogen bonding that really happens when we have a hydrogen stuck to an N, O, or F. Well, really what happens here is these things are very high electronegativity. So when they get together with a hydrogen, so let's say we have, like in H2O, our oxygen stuck to our hydrogen here. Since oxygen is very electronegative, we get a very strong dipole created. And because what we have here in the hydrogen, and that's why it's hydrogen bonding, it has to be one of these electronegative elements stuck to a hydrogen, when we get that shift in electron cloud away from the hydrogen, moving towards our oxygen, making this slightly negative here, and these slightly positive, well, we have a unique situation here with hydrogens. Is hydrogen really doesn't have any other electrons besides that one electron, so we get an exposed hydrogen nucleus in a very, very, very small atom. Remember, distance kills attractive forces. So in this particular case, this semi-positive 
is basically an exposed nucleus with very little distance between it and a neighboring water molecule. So what we end up with is a very, very strong type of dipole-dipole interaction. So strong and unique that it get its own, gets its own name, hydrogen bonding. So what you really have is a hydrogen with a very electronegative element um, with an unshared pair of electrons on it. And that's going to create a very, very strong type of dipole-dipole. So these stick together very, very, very well. So substance that would display this, each of these is a polar molecule. Each of these then has a dipole. Each of these has a hydrogen stuck to a very electronegative element with unshared pairs of electrons. And that's going to create a very strong type of dipole interaction between the, uh, the slightly negative area with its unshared pair of electrons and the exposed hydrogen nucleus of a nearby molecule. So one way to remember this is if it's strong enough, dipole-dipole becomes hydrogen bonding. Enough sounds like enough. So H to NOF is hydrogen bonding. Now the third type of intermolecular force is our only type of intermolecular force when we have a nonpolar molecule. Now technically, London forces are in every single molecule out there because in all situations you can have these strengthening of whatever dipoles you've got. Uh, so basically all molecules will display London forces, but in a nonpolar molecule it's the only type of intermolecular force. So it's a weak intermolecular force caused between the attraction of nonpolar molecules, or a, a weak intermolecular force between nonpolar molecules caused by momentary dipoles created by constantly shifting electrons. Um, even when you have a dipole, you have constant movements of electrons that can create uh, these increased dipoles. Uh, so all molecules display basically London dispersion forces. But in a nonpolar molecule, since there is no dipole, there is no hydrogen bonding, it's the only type of relevant hydrogen or intermolecular force. So we often talk about, well, it's a nonpolar molecule, it's London forces. All of them actually have London forces. But in a nonpolar molecule, it's all we've got. Now, larger molecules are going to have larger momentary dipoles. And what really happens here, picture a very simple molecule. It's cut in half. Now, we generally have in a nonpolar molecule an equal distribution of electrons. But those electrons are in constant motion. So at any given point in time, you may have only one on this side and three on that side. That's going to cause a momentary dipole caused by the movements of the constantly moving electrons. Now, what happens in this particular case is that momentary dipole basically can induce another momentary dipole in a nearby atom. So a strong negative side can push away electrons, creating a dipole in the next one. And this is actually something we get into more in chapters 10 and 11. But at this point, you need to understand, if we have a nonpolar molecule, its only type of intermolecular force is a London dispersion force. Now, next section, we get into covalent bonding and what's known as orbital overlap. So basically, we have orbitals that exact electrons exist at inside atoms. Well, when we have these valence electrons involved in bonding, it would make sense that the sharing of electrons is going to be in a different region of space than the electrons that originally existed at inside the atom. So what we're really forming here are new types of orbitals that we have in covalent situations inside molecules. So electrons and atoms are found in atomic orbitals. So what happens to these orbitals when atoms share electrons in a molecule? Now, Lewis structures in Vesper theory give us the shape and location of electrons in a molecule, but they don't really explain why chemical bonds actually form. So we need a new type of theory to deal with looking at new types of bonds forming in a covalent situation. And what we use is valence bond theory. So a covalent bond forms when the orbitals on two atoms overlap. Now, the shared region of space between the orbitals is called the orbital overlap. And there are two electrons, usually one from each atoms of opposite spin, that are going to exist in these orbital overlap or new types of orbitals. So covalence bonds form when orbitals of two atoms overlap. And remember that shared region in between is our orbital overlap. So if you take a look at the situations down here, when we have S orbitals, remember those were spherical shapes. So here we have a couple of S orbitals coming together in the case of hydrogen. And they're going to form to make our H2 molecule. Well, what we really have here is an overlap of S's. Now, another type of situation we can have is between the S and one atom, like hydrogen and only has a 1S electron, so it's in an S orbital. 
if it comes together with chlorine. Now, the electrons in chlorine that are involved in bonding, remember, they used to be in p orbitals because that's where those outer electrons are at in chlorine that where we had empty apartments basically were our p apartments. So we can have an s and p type overlap or in the case of diatomic chlorine we can have p's overlapping. In each of these situations we have overlaps occurring between s's and p's. Now one quick idea about overlap and this should sound familiar to what I talked about earlier. Increased overlaps bring the electrons and the nuclei closer together which decreases potential energy. Um, so basically those strong attractions as they move closer together lower your potential energy and that's exactly what we're seeing on this half of the graph here. And remember it also is increasing just a slight amount our electron to electron repulsion but our gain in energy advantage from our uh, attraction forces are significantly higher than what's happening with our electron to electron repulsion. Until we get right here past that point so in this range, that electron-electron repulsion becomes so incredibly strong that now it's an energy disadvantage to move closer together. So fundamentally what happens is we end up with a bond distance right here and an overlap between those two atoms there. So as these atoms come together, we end up with an overlap occurring between the two. Now if the atoms get too close, remember the internuclear repulsion then becomes very, very large and that ends up being an energy disadvantage to move closer together. Now, single covalent bonds are going to always be caused by a share of two valence electrons, and it's going to be basically two specific atoms which are going to be joined. Now, atomic orbitals are going to overlap, and electrons are going to be centralized now in a new region of space, not around the old nucleuses, but between the two atoms' nuclear uh, nucleuses in a new molecular orbital. So these overlaps are really forming a new molecular orbital. Now this type of bond where the electrons are shared between the you know internuclear area is what's known as a sigma bond and you should remember sigma bonds from last year but we probably never really gave you a really good description of why we call it a sigma bond. So if we have two s orbitals from separate atoms coming together what's going to happen is as they approach the electrons get shared between the two and we end up forming a new molecular orbital that basically is a combination of what we had before. Now you'll notice the electrons that live in this region of space are centered between and around those two nucleuses and that's what's called a sigma bond. When the electrons are centered around the axes between our nucleuses then we have what's known as a sigma bond. So that's where the electrons are at inside a sigma bond. Now when we have an overlap of P's coming together really the same type of thing happens as those two move close together the electrons shift from where they used to be in the atoms to a new region of space between our nucleuses. So this is also a sigma type of bonding here because of where the electrons predominantly are at. S and P overlaps would end up doing the same thing. So sigma bonding is basically when we have an overlap of S's or S's and P's and the electron ends up existing between that inner nuclear axis area. Pi bonding on the other hand is what we get with multiple bonds. It's a different type of overlap because remember in one region of space we can only have up to two electrons existing in these orbitals. So in these molecular orbitals it's the same idea. So where our pi bonds are at is a slightly different location than where our sigma bonds are at. So how do pi bonds form in multiple bonds? Well if you have S, or I'm sorry, S's overlapping with S's or S's overlapping with P's or the same direction P orbitals overlapping, you're going to end up sharing the electron in between the nucleuses. That's a sigma situation. Well, remember we also have P X's and P Y's besides our P Z's. So we basically have three different types of um, P orbitals. Two of those orbitals will overlap making a uh, sigma bond, but the other two aren't going to overlap in the same way. Those electrons aren't between the nucleuses, they're above and below when they overlap. So what happens when these types of P's come together is the electrons now exist above and below the internuclear distance. And that's what a pi bond is. And the reason why we can have a triple bond is we also have another P orbital that is on this axis. And those can come together and share in front of and behind. So we have two types of pi overlaps, one above and below and one in front and in back. 
So that's why single bonds are sigma bonds, and the first bond in a multiple bond is a sigma bonds. So all single bonds are sigma bonds. In a double bond, we have one sigma and one pi. In a triple bond, we have one sigma and two bi pi's. So our first bond is always a sigma. That's an overlap in the internuclear distance. And our other overlaps can't be in the same region of space. Those are going to be our pi bonds. And that ends our second set of notes over chapter 9.